Welcome to Edinburgh, Scotland's historic capital and one of the world's most beautiful cities. There are thousands and thousands of fetching roads, streets, lanes and closes out there among Edinburgh's skyline on this atmospheric evening. But through the heart of the city, there runs one thoroughfare that has played a key role in Edinburgh's history and is a must visit for everyone to this day. I'm of course talking about the Royal Mile, the iconic collection of streets that runs for just over a mile between the Palace of Holyrood House, the King's official residence in Scotland, and this point, Castle Rock, on which there stands the majestic Edinburgh Castle. On this walk, we'll take a stroll down the entire length of the Royal Mile as we take a look at its many famous sites and learn the stories old and new that have unfolded on its cobbles and pavestones. But we begin with Edinburgh Castle, arguably the most important building on the entire Royal Mile. Sat high overlooking the city from atop a 340 million year old volcanic rock, Edinburgh Castle is generally considered the genesis for Edinburgh the point from which the city we know today first grew. A fortress of immense size and stature, Edinburgh Castle's earliest origins can be traced back all the way to the Iron Age, when native tribes people built a fort here on top of Castle Rock. The castle that we know today, however, is a little newer, likely built around a thousand years ago in the 11th century AD, during the reign of the Scottish King Malcolm III. Over the course of the last millennium, however, this castle has evolved considerably, transforming from what was originally a fortress of mostly wood to a mighty, almost impenetrable stone citadel that came to represent growing royal power in Scotland. Today, Edinburgh Castle is made up of buildings and sectors constructed in almost every one of the last nine centuries, its oldest building being St Margaret's Chapel, built in 1130 by King David I, and its newest features having been added in the 20th century. Throughout all that time, Edinburgh Castle has seen some of the most significant people in Scottish and British history pass through its gates, most notably including Mary Queen of Scots, who gave birth to her son, James VI and I of Scotland and England, inside this castle. Nowadays, the mighty fortress that draws in hundreds of thousands of visitors every year is fronted by this wide open space, known as the Esplanade, built in 1753 and a magnificent spot to take in some views across Edinburgh from up on high, as well as a place where important military parades have taken place for hundreds of years. After all, as well as being a major tourist attraction, Edinburgh Castle still doubles as an active military barracks with capacity for as many as 600 soldiers. Those soldiers are typically stationed at the castle's so-called new barracks, built in the late 18th century after a tumultuous period for Scotland, Edinburgh and the castle in particular. As we take a look off the northern side of Castle Rock, Edinburgh Castle has often been called the most besieged place in Great Britain, having been subjected to no less than 23 different sieges over the centuries, from English assaults in the medieval era to the notable events of the Jacobite rebellions during the 18th century, where anti-British government rebels captured the city of Edinburgh without a fight, but left the castle as the last stronghold of forces fighting in the name of the British King. Despite their successful capture of Edinburgh as Jacobite fever swept across Scotland, pro-government forces refused to surrender, and the Jacobites eventually called off their assault of Edinburgh Castle, leaving the British monarchy to ultimately demand that the fortress's defences be beefed up even further with the building of the new barracks and the esplanade, as we've mentioned. In later years, Edinburgh Castle was used as a prisoner of war camp during the Napoleonic Wars and the American War of Independence, while today it remains a major fixture at the heart of Scotland's capital, notable in particular for its booming one o'clock gun a historic time signal that has seen a large cannon fired off the side of the castle six days a week ever since 1861. The one o'clock gun, the magnificent views and the riveting history are just a few of the reasons that Edinburgh Castle is visited by so many people from all over the world. But we mustn't forget that this isn't the only landmark that's worth exploring on the mighty Royal Mile. So as we now make our way onto the Royal Mile proper, let's make exactly clear what this famous route through the heart of Edinburgh actually is. To be pedantic, the Royal Mile isn't actually a street, 
but a collection of five streets in succession that run from west to east, from the castle to the Palace of Holyrood House, passing through the heart of Edinburgh and its neighbouring borough known as the Cannon Gate, over a total distance of approximately 1.1 miles. The reason that the Royal Mile is actually slightly more than a mile long is that its name comes from a slightly different measurement, a Scots Mile, equivalent to 1.1 miles as we use them nowadays. And along those 1.1 miles, there are so many magnificent landmarks to be seen, one being right here on the first street of the Royal Mile, Castle Hill. The church building that stands beside us here is the Tollbooth Kirk, designed in a beautiful Gothic style that makes it one of the most eye-catching sights on the entire Royal Mile. No mean feat when you consider that it's just one of four major churches that you'll find on this iconic thoroughfare. Further down the Royal Mile, there's also the historic Cannon Gate Kirk, the mighty Tron Kirk, and of course, St Giles Cathedral, one of the most important buildings in Scotland. And all of these imposing churches mingle with historic residential blocks, pubs, shops and smaller churches that populate the Royal Mile as we know it today. The Royal Mile of course runs through the heart of Edinburgh's world famous Old Town, a UNESCO World Heritage Site which comprises stunning architecture like the Tolbooth Kirk of 1844, but which is also well known for its system of closes, tiny alleyways that spurt off the Royal Mile here and run down off the slopes of the Old Town in both a north and south direction. As we walk the entirety of the length of the Royal Mile, we'll pass by as many as 80 different closes, each with their own fascinating backstories and intriguing atmospheres. We won't be able to walk down each and every one, because we'd never make it to Holyrood Palace at the other end of the mile, but we'll stop and take a brief look at a few as we continue our walk. Making our way eastwards now, we've walked onto the second street of the Royal Mile, this slightly more wide open, cobbled street known as Lawn Market. Lawn Market takes its name, as you might expect, from a market of the 15th century, which was known for the sale of so-called inland merchandise, everything from yarn to cloth, stockings and such, and it was historically known as the Land Market, a name which eventually evolved over time into Lawn Market. Now Lawn Market is technically a part of the High Street, which means you could consider the Royal Mile to only be comprised of four streets in total. But it's a part of the route which very much has its own identity, not least due to one of the men who used to live overlooking it nearly 240 years ago. As you'll have spotted from that plaque, Robert Burns, Scotland's famed national poet, once lived in a house that overlooked Lawn Market, and sat above this alleyway, Lady Stairs Close which leads us off the Royal Mile briefly into a delightful little square. Now Burns' historic address just beside where we're standing now has given this part of Edinburgh a strong connection with Scottish literature, and the building that we can see in front of us here, officially named Lady Stairs House, is the home of the Scottish Writers' Museum, which chronicles the life of Robert Burns as well as that of fellow Scottish writers Sir Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson known for the famous Waverley novels and works like Treasure Island and Jekyll and Hyde, respectively. Robert Burns, meanwhile, is less well known for celebrated novels, but rather poems and songs. He spent many years of his life travelling around Scotland collecting folk songs, one such being the famed song Old Lang Syne, sung today around the world at New Year's. Burns's literary credentials, which included many of his own original poems too, make him one of Scotland's greatest muckers, and the square that we've walked off just now is known as Muckers Court. Muckers being a Scots word referring to an author or poet, but more simply, a person who makes. Walking out of Muckers Court and back onto the Royal Mile now, we're coming to the end of Lawn Market, at the point where the Royal Mile is intersected by the major street known as George IV Bridge, along which you'll find other major Edinburgh landmarks, including the Bank of Scotland, the National Museum of Scotland, Victoria Street, and the beloved Greyfriars Bobby Fountain. As you'll no doubt know, there are countless landmarks all over Edinburgh with their own captivating stories, but here on the Royal Mile, we're now looking towards the High Street, home to a number of the most significant buildings in the country. 
Of course, the visually stunning and physically immense church building that we can see just up ahead is St Giles Cathedral, a parish church dating all the way back to the 12th century, and which today still plays a crucial role in life in Edinburgh, Scotland and the entire United Kingdom. Over the centuries, St Giles, which started out its life as a tiny medieval church, has both shaped and been shaped by Edinburgh's long history. The original church that existed on the High Street was destroyed by English raids in the year 1322, along with much of medieval Edinburgh around it. As such, the building that we know today dates mostly from a rebuild of the 14th century and a later expansion of the 16th century by which time St Giles had come to serve as the centre point of Edinburgh's iconic old town. Not only is St Giles Cathedral visually amazing, however, but it's also played its part in a number of major historical events. In 1384, for example, a secret meeting was held here between the Old Alliance of Scotland and France, who drew up plans together to attack England. Rather interestingly, the modern Consulate General of France still stands opposite St Giles Cathedral on this square, Parliament Square, among the cobbles of which you'll find this, the beautiful heart of Midlothian, an iconic Scottish mosaic that locals unusually spit on for good luck, said to have arisen as this was once the site of executions at Edinburgh's old toll booth, and passers-by would spit in disgust at executions taking place. Looking back up at St Giles, meanwhile, the cathedral is also notable as the place where the Protestant reformer John Knox preached during the Scottish Reformation of the 16th century, and, most recently, the place where the late Queen Elizabeth II lay in rest for 24 hours after her death at Scotland's Balmoral Castle in 2022, bringing an end to the longest reign of any monarch in British history. The Royal Mile as a whole was a key element in the events that took place following the Queen's death, as on her journey from Balmoral all the way back down to London, her coffin was brought along the Royal Mile from her official Scottish residence, Holyrood Palace, to St Giles Cathedral here, accompanied by her son, King Charles III, and thousands of members of the public. Those events of the 21st century demonstrate the significance of the Royal Mile in the modern day, but centuries beforehand, this part of the Royal Mile, the High Street, was still a thriving place, thought to have been the most populated part of Edinburgh in the late medieval era. By the 16th and 17th centuries, the High Street was lined with residential buildings as many as 11 storeys high, and much trade took place on the cobbles underneath, as signified by the presence of Edinburgh's historic Mercat Cross, or Market Cross, here behind St Giles Cathedral. Although the monument that we can see here was built relatively recently in the Victorian era, it occupies a point in Edinburgh very close to where the borough's original Mercat Cross stood, dating as far back as the year 1365. Over the centuries, various new Mercat Crosses were built and occasionally moved to different points along the High Street, but the monument that exists today is arguably the most splendid of all, and an eye-catching reminder of just how long this part of Edinburgh has been busy with activity. Of course, as well as the events surrounding the cathedral, the castle and Scotland's old parliament buildings that we've passed by too, the High Street is perhaps the best demonstration of how the Royal Mile's role has changed in Edinburgh through the years, yet still remains central to life in the city. Although the building of Edinburgh's new town in the 18th and 19th centuries was designed to create a new, modern centre for shopping and business in the city, the High Street and the Royal Mile have never seen their status decline still favoured among locals and visitors alike compared with Prince's Street, the Royal Mile's equivalent as the main street in the new town. On a colder and darker evening like today, the Royal Mile may be quieter than you'd expect, although its fetching architecture gives it an enchanting atmosphere that feels like a different world to the lively, packed days you'll see in the summer and during the famous Edinburgh Festival. Now so far we've made our way just about a third of a mile along the entire length of the mighty Royal Mile. From Edinburgh Castle to St Giles Cathedral, this stretch of the famous route is already full of history, but there's a lot more to come as the Royal Mile continues on its way from this point towards its end at the Palace of Holyrood House. We'll make our way down to the end of the Royal Mile in the second part of this walk, so please join me as we pass down further along the High Street 
through the Cannon Gate, past the modern Scottish Parliament buildings, and towards the monarch's official residence in Scotland. I hope to see you then, but for the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to Edinburgh's enchanting Royal Mile.